So now it's extra ominous. It's that kind of cafe. Well, I think uh -huh. that's where I get to leave meeting, isn't it? <laughs> I know. We get the choice. I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm gone. <laughs> Wait, how did Paul get his coffee? Come on. Yeah. Simon, Simon, tea. It's tea. Good. Yeah, it's afternoon tea time in, on it's the East Coast. Time. And on the East Coast, it's 4 p.m. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Hey, Simon, have the uh, graduate students had their union? <clears throat> been uh, accepted by the administration of Columbia yet? Um, it's, uh, <laughs> well, they're in negotiation right now, and uh, they, the students have been on strike just recently. I'm not sure where we are right now. Oh, wow. It seems like they're very close, but there are some sticking points. This has been going on for a while. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is the first time I think they striked. But they're close to a contract. Well, I see not Simon. approved. They can always go work for Amazon, I guess. What's that? They can always go work for Amazon if they don't get a, get, a, get into the union at Columbia. The Students' Union uh, uh, at Columbia is the United Auto Workers. What? Yeah, yeah. The, the union okay. that the students are part of is uh, United Auto Workers Union. Interesting choice. Apparently the um, aircraft engineers are in the carpentry and joiners union. Comes from working on the spruce goose. I'm gonna give it a minute or two past the starting time just to let people roll in. We're still getting a lot of a lot of pinging on the side. Yeah, this you guys is are typical, quite popular. Typical Zoom protocol. Yes. And plus, since we're California hosting it, we have to just start it, like, I think, five minutes late. That's the rule. Hmm. So most of you are on the East Coast, though, right? Yep, I'm in New York City. Yeah. Yes. In DC. Well, have my coffee. At least I got that part right. <laughs> I have to say, uh, you know, it's a good thing there's no dues for the NSSA. I think that. Uh, the amount of I paid for the coffee is comparable with that. It's all consistent. So, yeah. You're just you're trying to take my joke now. I told that joke yesterday. And, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I that's I'm totally gonna make that joke, and it's. I, well, I, I, I'm gonna say too. Camille can vouch. I told that joke yesterday in one of our meetings, and Brent is trying to steal my joke. Oh, I see. <laughs> all right. We, well, didn't record, uh, we didn't record. We didn't record that meeting though, so we have no proof of that. You could just say oh, it's your joke right, that I stole. That's fine. Oh, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to give it one more minute, then I'm going to start whether people are rolling in or not. Very good. Because I'm originally from the East Coast, so I like to start things on time. Okay, awesome. I th it looks like everything is calming down a bit. We're getting a little bit less of the buzzing on the side. And even if we don't, that's okay. So I'm just gonna get us started. You guys ready? Yeah, sure. Or ready or not, we're, I was gonna say ready or not, we're starting, I guess. So hello everyone. Welcome to the first installment of the Neutron Cafe brought to you by the Neutron Scattering Society of America. So here at the Neutron Cafe, we might not have the trendiest new espresso beverage to try, but we offer all of our drinks free of charge. So Neutron jokes aside, my name is Claire Saunders and I am speaking to you today from Pasadena, California, 
where I am a PhD student at California Institute of Technology. I'm also the graduate student representative on the NSSA Executive Committee. And so for the next hour, I'm gonna be your host. And so since this is our first time doing this, I'm gonna give you a quick rundown of what's gonna go on. This series, it's a way to connect neutron scatterers in all steps of their career and build more of a community, particularly in these times where the majority of our connection are through these screens. So today we're sitting down just to have a conversation about a particular science topic. We encourage you to ask your questions, whether you do it through, I don't know if we have the Q&A set up, I think it's probably just Messenger over the Zoom or through comments for those of you who are tuning in over Facebook Live. And my um, co-host Hubert King will be passing me questions so I can pass them on to our speakers. So now let's we'll just get to our topic at hand. So one of the things that always has drawn me to neutron scattering is how data rich of a field it is. And today we're gonna to talk about a project I've always been like uniquely aware of and fascinated by because of the people I've worked with and some of the projects I've chosen along the way in my very short career so far, which it's the distributed data analysis for neutron scattering experiments project. I had to look at that just because I've always just called it dance project. Between 2004 and 2011, was funded approximately 13 million, if I calculated that correctly, between design and construction phases by the National Science Foundation for computer software to analyze neutron scattering experiments. When you think about that project now, it makes a lot of sense. Why wouldn't you wanna make software to reduce and analyze all the data you're collecting at a brand new user facility? However, for me, it was a little wild just to sit down and think about like 2004, what was happening at the time. So at the time I was, I was actually, I was starting middle school. It was the year Facebook was founded and Skype was really establishing itself as one of the 21st century forms of communication, which thinking about that now, I think we'd all go crazy without the video chat that we have. And the Splatian neutron source would not really be completed until 2006. So in 2004, the idea was really not as straightforward. It was actually a little bit wild. So with that, I'm thrilled to introduce our interviewees for today, four of the original principal investigators of the dance project. So if you could each give a wave, nod, curtsy, whatever you decide to do as I call your name, I have you all spotlighted so everyone can see you. So first we have Brent Fultz, who is the Barbara and Stanley Ron Jr. Professor of Material Science and Applied Physics at the California Institute of Technology. So Brent led the dance project and was the PI of the Inelastic Subgroup. I'm also very lucky to call him my PhD advisor. Hello, Brent. <laughs> and so next we have Simon Billand, who is a professor of applied physics, applied mathematics and material science at Columbia University. He is also a physicist at Brookhaven National Laboratory. Simon was the PI of the diffraction subgroup. Next we have Paul Butler, who is a team leader, who is a team leader at NIST Center for Neutron Research. He's also affiliated faculty at University of Delaware in the chemical and biomolecular engineering department and adjunct faculty in chemistry at University of Tennessee. At the time of the dance project, Paul was the PI of the small angle neutron scattering subgroup. And last but not least, we have Paul Kinzel who is a computer scientist at the NIST Center for Neutron Research. And at the time of the dance project, Paul was the PI for the reflectometry subgroup. So with all of that said, I just wanna start off with since we're in a cafe, we all, most of us have coffee or tea. How's everyone's day been so far? <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I already touched a little bit on this. So most of you guys are on the East Coast, except for Brent and I, we're, we're both in Pasadena, but where's everybody located for those of us who are just signing in? So I'm in uh, sunny Brooklyn which is part of New York City. Oh, I love Brooklyn. That's where my, my brother lives in Brooklyn. Oh yeah, which yes. part? Um, so he's, he's at Brooklyn Law, so I don't really, I just wander the streets near Brooklyn Law School when I visit him. Okay, I'm not sure where that yeah. is, probably, probably yeah. downtown. Yeah. I'm, in, uh, I'm in Williamsburg, so just over the okay. bridge from the city, yeah. How about the rest of you guys? I, I'm sitting here in Gaithersburg, uh, the not so sunny, right now, Gaithersburg, uh, right outside the gates of uh, NIST. Um, 
not uh, working, working, uh, teleworking, maximum teleworking. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> and, right. and in, fact, uh, in fact, I just, uh, I had to stop working on SAS so that I could talk to you. Well, we appreciate that. We do. <laughs> Both the working on SAS and, <laughs> and talking to us today. <laughs> All your music. Sorry, there's some background noise. I'm in Bethesda, which is just a little to the east of Gaithersburg and um, um, sitting here in a nice, not quite sunny day and um, um, enjoying the peace and quiet of not having to go into work every day. Um, the, uh, yeah, I've forgotten the context, sorry. Oh. Is that I don't get to bug you. Yeah, there's that. Despite that, I still spent the morning working on um, Revel 1D and periodic tables. So um, yes, dance is uh, constantly in my life. Quite amazing. I remember those efforts. At, well, it was called Sandsview, I think, when you were uh, with dance, but it doesn't sound too different now, actually, Sassview. But, uh, and of course, the Revel 1D. Yeah, very good. So when was the, I have to say, like, so you guys, I read somewhere, I think that you guys had weekly phone calls when, when dance was going on for like five years straight. Yeah, we had a lot of meetings, actually. We had uh, various types of uh, uh, interactive uh, video meetings every week. It was sort of like group meetings. We would cycle through the different developers who had an idea or they were trying to design something. We'd go through it. But yeah, it went on for a long time. We had like three in-person meetings a year too. Uh, uh, Paul was joking about coming to Pasadena a lot. And indeed, um, occasionally we would go out to the uh, East Coast, uh, to the SNS or, uh, well, not the East Coast, but the East time zone and uh, also to Washington DC area for the NSF, making them happy was important too. It was a very, um big and kind of sprawling project and we didn't have very good tools really like that at that time there was no git and there was no github so i remember talking to uh michael ivasis at some point and he was saying wow have you seen this new thing git and i was like no i haven't seen git and so now like the whole kind of open source infrastructure of everything is based on git and github and it was just being rolled out sometime in the middle of our project and none of our code was under Git control. It was all under different kind of various flavors of SVN. Yeah, we had CVS at the beginning, which is yeah, now a CVS, pharmacy, I yeah, think. Yeah, and then, yeah. And then uh, big, big step to SVN, right? And, and That's right, that was a big advance. Yeah, and then Mike McKearns was doing the project management using Microsoft Excel. Which was which was completely, uh, you know, I don't know what language we're allowed to use, but it was badass. Like, yeah. it's his. <laughs> <That's insane. laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, so he's he's uh, managing like a thirteen million dollar project with dozens of people involved, and he's doing it with Excel spreadsheets. He, he, well, he also had the uh, uh, Gantt charts and so on for a Microsoft Project, which was a, a way of assembling all of the 600 tasks that I think we identified that had to be done over five years. It was an insane number. And how do you get the progress on those charted? And that was uh, Mike McCurran's problem. Uh, he, it kind of worked for about six months, but there, this is really following hardware construction practices. And that's how it uh, was funded as a uh, construction project from the NSF. At the same time, there was a series connected high field magnet, which was funded for the National Magnet Lab. So there were these two very different projects, uh, but both of them were supposed to have, you know, earned value management. And uh, we, we did our best for a couple so, of years. Like, cause that, that was, that was going to lead to one of my questions. Like how does, like in 2004, one day, like you guys just sort of woke up saying, we're going to need to, we have this huge facility. We're going to have all this data we're going to need to just find a way to manage all of it. And you're gonna have all these, you don't have the tools to do it. And like, where do you even apply for funding for something like this? Um, like it, it, because even when you're saying it now, like there's no Git, there's no project management tools. It, it sounds, and the, the funding level for it too, you guys, you guys were a, 
considering like with the, the Bay Area software project, you guys were like a considerable size software company. You're sounding like the reviewers, Claire, actually. Uh, I, uh, they I never had be, those same that concerns. Was a, we're recording. Yeah. You don't have to insult me. No, no, it's, it's, it's <laughs> legitimate, I think, uh, quite legitimate. Um, <laughs> I mean, I remember having conversations with Brent where we would discuss how on earth are we going to fund software development? And I, we probably had these conversations with uh, Paul too, uh, you know, prior, prior to that, because it's always a problem. We would always like do software development um, on the side. You would have to write a proposal to NSF to do some science, some novel science. And then as part of that science, you would write a little bit of software and then you would release that bit of software, but there was absolutely no mechanism whatsoever for, for getting software funded. And so Brent and I would have conversations about this because we both had an interest in doing this. And then we would, you know, we would just kind of chew the card and maybe we should try this, maybe we should try that. And then I think it was probably Brent who, who thought, you know, this, this, looks, this looks a little bit like an instrument and it would therefore fit into this MRI program at NSF, which is their way of building instruments at facilities. So it was, I think it was a stretch for everyone, and it was a little bit of a stretch for NSF. But It was. Uh, they were very bold, I think, to support it. Yeah, yeah. So I think was, the, the, the other half of that right was SNS. <clears throat> uh, Ian, right. Anderson, Ian Anderson basically realized that they're building SNS, that they didn't have any money. Uh, they were running out of money with their costs and everything else, and then the reductions and you know the the data acquisition systems and what how much money is left. And I think that's one of your cells you made, Brent, right at some of the meetings was this inverted pyramid of money. Um, mm -hmm. It down to the to handling the data. There's no money left to build to build those tools. And uh, right. so NSF SNS was uh, <clears throat> was heavily on board with getting with with uh, getting uh, some way of, of Fund, getting more funding for, for that. But I just want to add one thing to that because in, in hindsight, right? And I remember a number of people in the community who came to me and said, this is, in, you know, we do reviewers, right? This is insane. 13, I think it was $11 million originally when it was being uh, one of the first reviews. So, this is insane. I can do, I can build an instrument for that. Why would I pay for software for that? I can write this myself. And, and I think one of the big takeaways that hopefully a lot of the people in the community learned was actually $13 million is actually tiny amounts of money for the kind of thing. We, if now looking back at what Brent proposed originally, that was just insane. That the, and, and given the tools we had at the time, thinking we could do that money was completely insane. Um, but that's part of the process is we, we learned a lot right, in, in this. And I think it was good for the community in general. I'm glad you brought up Ian Anderson. He was a major supporter of it. I had uh, uh, a lot of interactions with him when I was the PI to build the ARC spectrometer. And we knew we were going to have to have a lot of software development for that. You have, you know, 10 to the fifth pixels uh, for position. Then you have each one with a time spectrum of a thousand channels. Uh, no human can make any sense of that, of course. So we knew there were going to have to be a lot of uh, uh, tools for uh, assembling the data into engineering units that we could look at. And Ian was uh, quite supportive, and uh, about uh, halfway through the ARCS project, maybe 2002 or 2003, uh, well, it's going on at the SNS with the other instruments. I think what happened was they had all of the instrument scientists write specifications, and they uh, were going to say everything that they needed in the software, and uh, they were going to assemble this, and uh, another group would write it for them, basically, but the instrument scientists were too busy, really, to write the software themselves. So the, uh, uh, the challenge was that a lot of it didn't get written, and, uh, or it was done in a very uh, simple way. And it was a, a bit of an issue uh, at the beginning for the SNS uh, to have the data uh, reduced. And then uh, the question is, should we do that? And there's a big ch challenge that came up for the NSF. Uh, that would be supporting the operations of a DOE facility, right? If we were to write software for the data reduction for the instruments there. So we had to find a little path forward, which was pretty clear now. I mean, there's a lot of analysis software that needs to be done uh, independent of the instrument uh, specifics. 
And uh, we took that path, although that was a little bit controversial. Why do we need to do that? Can't graduate students do that at the universities, you know? And uh, yes, indeed they do. And they, uh, they graduate and then the next student does the same thing again and again, and we don't make a lot of progress. So the hope was that we would have a little bit more of an archival uh, uh, development uh, uh, trunk in some way. Uh, and uh, it, it was a little hard to get it to all to transition smoothly, but uh, a number of the people from the dance project ended up uh, uh, staying with it. And I hear uh, funny things uh, before we started with Paul Butler and Paul Kinsel and, uh, you know, keeping the, uh, uh, the development going. And I know Simon is pretty active too. Uh, we do that uh, at Caltech, but a number of the developers ended up at the SNS too. Uh, trying to think of uh, Matthew Duche, uh, uh, was there. Uh, it was Peter Peterson, I think, uh, was was there too. Yeah, um, Peterson went to our show. From yeah, that's right, and Zhao Lin. So uh, quite a number of people took that path. Um, it could have been maybe a little bit smoother, but I think the NSF was very worried about that transition. And especially about halfway through the dance project, they were kind of complaining, you know, oh, well, who's gonna take this over? How's that gonna work? Um, I think, again, it was a view of how hardware works. You know, you build it, it's there, you maintain it, uh, you keep it going. It's a little different for maintenance of software though. So uh, there were a lot of things that needed to, uh, the, the hardware project was good for getting funding, but it didn't completely match a software effort. So this might be a controversial question that lights up the, the message board, but I always come back to it when I, I look at scientific software, especially as someone who's like, I've looked at stuff in, in consulting and everything too, but does it bring us back to like, should scientists be the ones that are writing scientific software? Because when we're looking at all of our backgrounds here, it's how did you guys, and Paul looks like Paul, one of Paul's laughing at me, but like how, like with coming into it, we, we teach ourselves how to code in a lot of these cases where a lot of us are self-taught. Um, um, Paul Kinzel, you're, an, you're a, I don't know how to say it, but bona fide computer scientist, but the rest of us, we're teaching ourselves data structures. And so we write these Fortran codes and I'm not bashing Fortran. I know how to code in Fortran, but it's, should scientists be the ones to write and maintain these software packages and is that what the NSF thinks obviously you can't answer that second part of the question but first of all Claire you need to start scripting in Python okay I do I do I love Python I, Python's my favorite Python and Julia I thought it was controversial you know in the that's I know that was like, that's yeah. another one of my questions yeah. for you guys I I want to hear about that controversy yeah there, there are certainly challenges um, having um, computer folk uh, write scientific software because they don't necessarily know what's important. Um, there's a um, uh, summer student, uh, advanced summer student in um, um, uh, associated with ISIS that I was supervising on the SASView project for a, a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, he was very good, very capable, but didn't necessarily know that, oh, this, um, um, this difference in the floating point values after you do the calculation doesn't matter, but that one does, even though they're in a similar order of magnitude. And so that, that um, uh, it helps to be grounded in knowing what it is you're measuring in order to produce code to, to do the computation. On the other hand, um, some of the getting the code to that does the computation, getting it to run fast and clean and maintainable, the scientist doesn't necessarily want to spend their time doing that. And so what you need is both types, and more importantly, somebody, somebody who can communicate between the two types. And that, that, that last one is uh, um, a challenging bit. Yeah, Universal that. translator doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. We definitely I, need to develop that. I laugh, Claire, because actually we give talks uh, not infrequently on the on the SASB project, and our starting slides are really about that very that, that very question you asked. Really? Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and the answer we come up with is really that it's everybody's responsibility, and and so uh, the scientists have to be involved. Facilities who produce the data have to be involved. We need we need science. We need uh, people who are who are experts at at coding, experts at math, and experts at the science all these people, it, it really needs to be a community effort. Uh, I remember, and I'm gonna go a little bit longer there because Brent, I think the very last meeting, in-person meeting, you brought 
somebody from NFOX uh, to give us a talk. And I, I remember his talk, he, he, he put it perfectly right at the end. He said, the problem is you need, you need the, the computer scientist brain. That's how you need to program it. And you need, and you need the science scientist brain. And the problem is that the connection between the two, the pipeline is very small. And so that communication is very difficult. And that's where you always have your problem. Ideally what you want, and you had this slide where the two brains come together, right? They go on top of each other. Somehow you need that communication, uh, that communication channel to go up. That's hard to do, to find in, in, in everybody. Uh, but one of the things I've appreciated over the years with the way SASPU has developed is that we have quite a large group of people around the world. Before the pandemic, we got together. In fact, in March of the pandemic, uh, two weeks two weeks after you shut down, uh, no, I think right as we were shutting down, the plan was for, the, for our next meeting to be at Caltech. We were going to be at Caltech to, to have our next uh, big meeting. We had about 20 people who were going to come and and work on the code. Uh, it's not perfect, nothing is perfect, right? It's the real world. But one of the things I really enjoy is that we have, we, there's always these tensions between uh, the people who don't code at all and who are really the scientists and who, who have you know, the, their, their view. And you have, the per, you have people who are entirely coders who, who have a view of, of perfection of how the code should, should look regardless of, of, of the functionality. <laughs> And these two, <laughs> these two can sometimes uh, be at odds. Uh, and then you have you have people who have uh, brilliant ideas on the math side. People who are looking more at you know is the output exactly correct from the scientific point of view. You have the guy who just I just want an answer uh, from this. And these are all people in the same room. And you get uh, you know and going going to lunch together, going to dinner together, and then arguing about it. Um, you know, you get, you, you don't, it's not the same brain together, but getting all those perspectives in the same room and, and hashing things out is I think uh, is the right answer in some way. I mean, it's all of the above is the answer to your question. Sorry, that was, <clears throat> you hit my soapbox, I'm stepping off now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks Paul. And especially somebody who loves documentation more than anything else in the world. They're, they're, they're really <laughs> useful to have on the project. Yeah. Absolutely. No, but that is critical because most people don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. and, right. it, and we find that, that you know, there are a few people who do. And so having those and yeah. Yeah, I've worked on projects that are poorly documented. It doesn't, it doesn't end well. Yeah. yeah. I think things but are I'm, much easier now um, uh, than they were because of a lot of the a lot of the workflows are now much more stable than they were back in the dance days. So there's a really kind of rather well defined community open source community development workflow based around GitHub, based around test driven development, um, based about using documenting your code in doc strings and then auto building the documentation things like this, right? And these have, these have evolved over time, but basically none of them existed back in 2004, 2005, and we were totally feeling around in the dark. But what I'm able to do now is I'm able to teach people in my group who are interested on the coding side, because these workflows are fairly stable now, I can teach them the workflows. And what I found is much easier to teach a physicist those workflows than it is to teach a computer scientist physics, physics and, and neutron scattering. And so uh, there's, a, there's a steady flow of people out of my group and they're, and they're in high demand actually. So uh, some of them go on to do academic work, but actually um, Paul mentioned NThought, which is, uh, many of you have heard of it, it's a big- um, SciPy. Yeah, yeah it, it runs SciPy, it's a big kind of Python, uh, uh, software consulting firm and Chris Farrow from the Dance Project is a is a senior manager at Enthought now, enormously okay. successful. Oh. Yeah, and another of my developers is at Amazon. Uh, I mean, they you know so there's a, there's I think that a lot of the companies are find these people attractive because they know how to do problem solving from their physics and chemistry and neutron scattering background, but they also know how to code at a fairly high level. Yeah, there's another guy, Pavel Juhas, he's at Google now. Yeah, I think that's a lot of that's too because some of the decisions you guys made in the dance project because you guys were the, I, I'm gonna sound like a millennial, but like you guys 
were the hipsters of some of the stuff here. You, you chose Python when Fortran was, when everyone was like, let's do Fortran. You guys did Agile when that uh -huh. wasn't necessarily the, I, I need to bring this up because I still think that that was, the, and the dance project too, when you look at it, it's so, it's modular, it's very modular. And mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate that looking at it as someone who used a lot of the components of it, even though Paul Butler is very upset that I have not used any of the SANS components and I'm so sorry. But, um, <laughs> but like, can we, can we talk a little bit more about some of that? Because I, like what led you guys I, I to can, do that? I, I can address the architecture a little bit because I didn't know anything about computer architecture in the year, say 2000, when the ARCS project was getting going. And I knew I needed help. So Caltech had the Center for Advanced Computing Research in those days. It, it started off as a, a project from the uh, uh, nuclear science side of DOE uh, to study high impact or something like this. But they had a number of people there, including a, so a real software architect, Michael Ivasis. And uh, Michael originally began his career as a theoretician in high energy physics and uh, drifted off into the software industry as he got more involved in programming. And early he showed me the um, uh, computing technical proposal uh, for the compact muon solenoid, which was uh, uh, being built at, uh, at CERN. And I was astonished by how organized this was. Uh, it had uh, hundreds of pages, probably 250 pages in it, all of it broken down into tasks and so on. And somebody had thought this thing through in a very thorough way and how it was gonna fit together. That's what Michael liked to do. He liked to organize large structures, elegant structures, I would say, not necessarily do the work in, in programming them, but, but he did uh, uh, have a set of ideas about how to organize things and came up with a, his own framework. He called it Pyre. Uh, it wasn't really a framework, but it was more of a philosophy for how you can write modular code with Python. And he really uh, emphasized the uh, encapsulation of, of the components uh, the uh, ability to add things on by, uh, in those days, uh, it was a big deal that you made Python wrappers for some C code or some Fortran code. So you can, you know, uh, the wrapper would know the entry points and exit points and so on of the actual compiled code. So it was actually a pretty big deal uh, to make that all work. And he was into that level of, of, of understanding. And he uh, uh, was very helpful in my education, uh, forcing me to uh, pick up the book by Abelson and Sussman, The Structure and Interpretation of uh, Computer Programs. I don't think they use it anymore at MIT, but it, they used to. And I'd never seen this stuff before. So I had to learn uh, object-oriented programming. He had his own view on what we needed to learn about it, which was very helpful. And he tried to be sort of a, uh, a guiding light for how we would structure the software with mixed success, okay, I have to say, because uh, uh, it doesn't mean just because he has a great vision means it's the most efficient thing to implement, as I, I hinted at. But he, he, I thought he was a lot of fun anyway. And uh, I know some of you got along with him better than others, but he was uh, certainly quite a character and uh, really made it more of a credible proposal when we wrote the construction proposal. What is it that you need to maintain a component of software, feeding it its input, output, how do you handle its error messages? Uh, you know, uh, what do you do? Uh, 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 do you wanna have this uh, assemble all at uh, you know, runtime, or do you want to have pre-compiled -compon uh, components at runtime, or do you want to make a big monolithic application? All of these things were uh, where he was able to provide guidance. And it was quite helpful. And uh, learning about uh, object-oriented programming was pretty important for me in the uh, early 2000s. Uh, so by the time the proposal had come together, uh, I think uh, Simon said it right. He uh, was talking about how we organized the community and the neutron community is already organized by areas, you know, with diffraction, engineering diffraction, inelastic scattering, small angle scattering, uh, uh, and uh, reflectometry. And we basically figured, well, we need somebody from each one of these topics uh, to head up an effort there. And quite frankly, there weren't a lot of choices. I mean, uh, that's, uh, I mean, uh, who else besides Paul Butler would we get for the Sands work, right? Uh, so, you know, it wasn't uh, so obvious uh, how, how to make this thing go. Uh, it, it wasn't a huge amount of uh, people there uh, who were able to uh, uh, fill the role. Uh, but trying to get everyone on the same wavelength uh, was 
uh, it wasn't really like herding cats. I think everyone had a pretty good attitude about it, uh, unlike cats, which will go off in random directions completely. Uh, but it was uh, often interesting when issues came back, the framework isn't supporting this feature, we need that. And uh, Michael would say why we couldn't do that in the framework, because you know, it would lead to instabilities or something like that. I uh, can't remember the exact example, but I think Paul Kinsel had a few of these where you could see uh, uh, that uh, we really couldn't uh, exactly follow the original plan. But anyhow, uh, learning about how to do the uh, programming by scientists was easier than having uh, the computer scientists uh, learn quantum mechanics. Uh, so uh, that's kind of uh, how we ended up uh, structuring the program. But like, so just making sure I do understand this though, like you, um, you picked up a textbook, taught yourself object-oriented programming and then led the dance project. Well, it was uh, Michael who was doing a lot of the actual uh, 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 writing of the uh, 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 concepts and the, the how to uh, what we would actually do. But at the time, I don't think the uh, uh, community cared that much about uh, the whether it was object oriented programming or a giant monolithic Fortran code. Uh, no, no, as long as it worked, okay, that was sort of the attitude there. Uh, so seeing the different ways of doing this, I thought was pretty interesting uh, and just to, uh, for intellectual curiosity. But the, uh, uh, um, the way that the code was actually written, we ended up having some flexibility in that, uh, we'll put it that way at the end. Um, but, you know, it, it could have been possible to have a, a more integrated uh, set of packages, maybe more libraries and so on, uh, that would be uh, used across the whole project. And some of them were, uh, but I think uh, uh, Matthew Duche came up with his own kind of uh, 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 um, graphical user interface approach, uh, independent of what Michael had done. And that was okay. I mean, it, it, it worked very well. Uh, there were still, remember, we were fighting battles like, you've got to be kidding. You mean, I can't run this on my laptop type of thing. What if I'm on an airplane and I want to do uh, uh, neutron uh, data analysis and I can't log in uh, to the server that does the calculations, you know? Uh, and what's this language Python anyway? I've never heard of this before. Uh, can't you do it in Java? Or uh, how about Fortran? Everybody programs in Fortran. Uh, so anyway, we had a lot of uh, things that were higher priorities, I would say, uh, to overcome in those days. And what would you guys say the biggest um, biggest hurdle you guys overcame? I got that I got that question a lot from people. They wanted me to ask you this: the biggest hurdle that you guys encountered that you did not foresee. And so you mentioned that people were just upset they couldn't run things on airplanes, they could not the Python, all that stuff. But was there anything else that really surprised you guys? That, that's a hard question. I mean, the whole yeah. thing was very very hard. Yeah. because of yeah. for, all, <laughs> for all the reasons that, that, that Brent has said that the scope that we originally envisaged was way off scale that we could possibly manage and the fact that we were teaching ourselves on the fly the fact that we were building on top of a framework which hadn't been built so yes. right. <laughs> <laughs> so the main problem with Pyre was not the concepts behind it it's just that actually it wasn't a stable framework, you know, it would be trying to write a, a paper in Microsoft Word. Well, and they're still making Microsoft Word, you know, it's, yeah. um, but we faced all of these. We were, we were using CVS and SVN to, to share code. There was no Git, you know, it was just, yeah, it was uh, hard in many- I, I think the, the most difficult part, in my opinion, was the way, it had to fit within a construction project for an instrument, which was the basic way it was funded out of the NSF. Uh, of course, we're glad we got the money and uh, we made use of it and we could do things with it. But it had, you know, to keep track of all the project progress of all the individual software efforts, you know, uh, tell us when you're 25% done. Tell us when you're 50% done. Uh, you know, are you 90% done? It was quite amazing how many of these uh, individual projects quickly got to 90% done and they stayed there for a very, very long time. You know, that type of thing. Uh, it was uh, difficult to... Uh, uh, keep track of the actual uh, uh, 
progress of, of, of it. And we were going to do this by having a lot of code reviews. And the code reviews uh, were supposed to happen at uh, several stages along the way of each one of these 600 tasks. But you can see, we're not going to do 1,800 code reviews. OK, that just wouldn't happen. So you know, the, uh, uh, the way you keep track of the progress on it was uh, uh, meant to be following uh, the rules for a hardware project. And uh, it's supposed to make one big delivery at the end when all of the instruments assembled and you uh, get the, the beam on it. Uh, but that's just not the way you do software. It, is, it, it should be much more iterative and uh, you uh, try things out, have many releases. We came to that eventually, but it flew in the face of all of the quality assurance things and uh, all of the other expectations for how to run a hardware project. Uh, so that, I, that, in my opinion, was the hardest thing, was uh, uh, to try to shoehorn this thing into a, uh, a framework for a hardware project, a funding framework. There was a big debate back in the day about waterfall versus agile, right? And I don't exactly know the history in the computer science industry, like exactly when this happened, but the old way of doing software was called waterfall. And it was more or less exactly what Brent described for the hardware. So you you start out by writing a requirements document where you, you write down in incredible detail every single thing that the software will ever do and uh, the architecture, how it's going to do it and everything. And then, and then you give this to a bunch of workers and they go away and they code it up and then you deliver it on a certain day. And, 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 and there were these mythical examples of horrendous software, expensive software failures that use this method. And that's where the Agile thing came from. And we were certainly discovering Agile on the fly, basically, and then trying to shoehorn our emerging Agile approaches into this thing that had been imposed on us, which was 100% waterfall. And yeah, that was, a, that was a massive headache and a colossal waste of all of our time. The notion that even hardware is ever done. Uh, people are constantly figure, fiddling with their instruments. Software is even more never done because you've never had a chance to implement all of the wonderful things that you could have or can, can conceive of. Yeah. I, I was going to add to that same thing, Paul. I mean, I think that's, to me, that was the biggest thing. Uh, is it software unlike hardware, even though hardware has maintenance and other things? There is no end to it. You do not deliver, particularly a uh, scientific software. It is not a delivery. It's a, it's an ongoing project. And this, I think, is something I realized later that NSF, I think, to this day, is still struggling with understanding. Is the cost for? I mean, you, if you don't continually in, invest in 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 maintaining, because maintaining means continually developing, because there are changes in architectures, there are changes in OS that you know there's changes. In, you know, are we going from Python 2 to Python 3? Well, that means we have to do all this sort of stuff. And oh, by the way, I have all this new science that needs all these new features done at the same time, right? It's a never any, so there is no end. And how do you fund this in a, in a sustainable way? And NSF has this problem, you have finite, you know, they, if, they, if they take every project that they funded and then fund it for the rest of it, for, for, for on and on forever, you run out of money very quickly, but, you know, with these funds, so how? How do you manage these kind of things? And I think that was a that was a difficult. When we came towards the end of the dance project, each one of us had to figure out our own way of how how exactly this was going to to, to how we're going to do this once the money stopped from NSF. Right. Um, when you proposed it, was it, it was it a project that was that had a definitive end? So was it? Yes. Did yeah. you know it was going to end? Okay. Yes, it, it, we knew that, and we also had to have a staffing profile that followed that to some extent. We knew okay. in the last year people would be looking for their jobs, for example, and they should. And actually, that was one of the big things, still not completely uh, uh, figured out, is how uh, somebody can uh, uh, move a, a, as a young career uh, a professional into this type of work and stay with it over time. Uh, I think it's to the credit of the SNS now that they have taken this very seriously and they have uh, now uh, 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 software instrument scientist type positions and that's great, but if those didn't exist uh, uh, some 10 years ago and uh, how you could uh, uh, have somebody make a transition and stay in the uh, uh, computational scattering science area uh, something we need. We need people who are good at this, but how do they 
uh, uh, find career paths. I think this improved a lot basically recently, but it was not good at all uh, as we were uh, uh, dealing with the, uh, uh, the dance project. And that was a concern, by the way, by some of the reviewers, they would say, what was gonna happen to these graduate students, these postdocs? I think they all landed on their feet, but not through any obvious way. I mean, it's not, uh, it wasn't a clear path for them. Yeah, and your, your point is right, uh, Brent, that actually facilities around the world are now starting to do the same thing, right? The SS is building into their thing, the, the data scientists that are part of each instrument. Uh, ISIS is starting to add that. Um, I think that, but that back in 2004, that was not a concept. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, even the, my visit to the China Spallation Source a couple of years ago, they had already started a software group there and they were good people, actually. They had about five, it's a bit small, but uh, nevertheless, these were the people who were gonna do the data analysis more than the actual uh, uh, data reduction. Uh, so uh, they were thinking about it then. They learned from our mistakes. And so would you guys say it really started that career path of Almost the computational material scientist, or the the, the computational like neutron scattering path for a graduate student. It's because up until then, it was it really a, a thing people did. Hmm. And not for the scattering. I think there are always, of course, computational theoretical groups and so on. Uh, and uh, that is a area that's totally exploded the computational material science, yeah. of course. And there's probably way too many people in it, quite frankly, considering the, the job prospects, but uh, some of them have specialty skills and those that are, I think, uh, uh, working in uh, the, the scattering science, uh, they're very valuable people for our community. I hope we can keep them. I think the kind of computation that you have to do to do the data analysis is getting to be more sophisticated too. So we were on the kind of leading edge of that and you know we were using fortran and that was like kind of cool and and i mean we were using uh, python and that, that was cool and new and we were using object oriented programming and that was cool and new but you know now now you have to do parallel computing and high performance computing and uh, you have to code on gpus and you have to uh, you have to deploy things in the cloud and you have to uh, pretty soon code on quantum computers, right? It's getting, you know, it's getting more complex and we are going to have to work with the computer scientists more over time and learn, learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, you know, Brent's relationship with Michael Ivasis was it's actually a good model. And I, I learned a lot from Michael, mm -hmm. transformed the way that I do software. Uh, Definitely. It's, it's getting much more, I, I notice it's getting much more complicated. Yeah, uh, um, yeah we're getting a lot of questions now from our audience. You guys have hit a couple of points that they have jumped on. The first one I want to hit is, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, please. Plus you have these uh, young people with expectations of the software that Google and Microsoft have developed that have all of these bells and whistles and it's, yeah. you know, it's not bug free, <laughs> but um, at least um, yeah. reasonably usable. And so the old uh, let's uh, let's provide somebody with a Fortran program that they have to learn how to compile, and then they have to write a little Fortran script to uh, load in their their inputs, and then this is and that's well the, the expectations are a lot different now. Yeah, that's one of the reasons too. I wanted to have this sit down conversation because when I when I'm, I'm working with other graduate students and they're asking like where did the software come from, I'm like you got to hear the story. It's a little it's a little wild, <laughs> but. Um, so one of the one of the questions we actually have from the audience is what it what do each of you guys consider the greatest success of the dance project? Another one of those big scoping questions. Let me comment on that first. I think there was a uh, uh, a view of software for neutron instruments as having everything in it from uh, the drivers for your printer all the way up to your keyboard inputs, uh, to uh, the data reduction, to the data analysis. And it was all kind of uh, uh, treated as a little bit more of a, uh, a garbled effort, uh, which uh, had everything all at once. And I think what we, we've 
got now uh, is not just dance, but I think the whole community has evolved to recognize a big difference between data reduction and data analysis. I mean, how do you uh, do the, uh, the computational work that uh, supports the scattering experiment, for example, separately from that of the reduction? And I think moving this whole field forward, I think is what uh, was the best thing that we did uh, for the uh, computational scattering science. I think that's true too. Um, we have uh, some successful software products that are widely used and we, right. we, can point, we can point to those. But if I look at NSF now and I look at their CSSI program and they have a large number of kind of cross, cross, cross division programs to support computation and I think that, that we were, you know, we, we were part of the seed for that. Like when, when the dance project went in, they'd never seen anything like it at NSF. And it's t it, it in some sense changed their mind about how software should be handled, scientific software. Um, and I think the community was moving in that direction anyway, probably, but but they had to put their toe in the water and they kind of did it with dance. So I think it's it's affected how we approach doing software for the neutron scattering for sure. But I think even at NSF, how they view supporting software, it's maybe had an effect on that. I'm not sure to what extent the uh, camera group at um, Berkeley is a DOE funding um, development of mathematical software for the um, 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 science facilities scattering community is, um, I'm not sure how much that is an outgrowth of, of dance or inspired by dance. Certainly useful to have the right people around to actually produce the algorithms that know how to, that, that, that can get the results that you need. And I, I, I echo really what, uh, what the Simon was, was saying. I think, to me, I think the biggest contribution was the lessons learned. We, I, I really think we were, we were the pioneers for, for our field, I think, in this, and also for NSF in, 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 in many ways uh, of, of going from everybody writes their own software and then when they retire or something happens to them, it disappears and you start over, right? That, that sort of model to something that's, that's more broadly usable and more, uh, and, and has, has a life and, and a community around it. That, uh, that I think that we were, I think dance was a big part of that, of that uh, process. No, absolutely. I, I like the use, I, I, I use the word hipster. You guys use the word pioneers. It's like, same <laughs> I'm an old it's, guy, either way, it's, I'm either an old way guy. it's cool. Either way, I think it's, I think it's amazing. Another one of the questions we're getting is how did you guys define the boundary between what the facility is going to provide and where your project starts the data processing? And did you make assumptions that now really seem obsolete? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Uh, this was, uh, as I hinted at, one of the big sources of friction at the NSF uh, to begin with. Are we going to be just using NSF money to support operations of a DOE facility? Uh, how do we divide that line? Um, and in fact, in the beginning, we still had some things at Caltech we were doing to support the arc spectrometer. Uh, so that was actually included within uh, dance, but that faded out. And I think overall, it became pretty clear now that uh, the uh, it's instrument by instrument variable. And there are a number of cases where you need to have feedback from the uh, analysis back into the measurement that you're doing. But generally you can kind of define the reduction as the things that have to be done for that particular instrument and uh, can only be done at the facility. And we don't do that. Uh, we didn't see that as the role for dance later. Uh, that also led to questions as, uh, well, why should you even be doing this? That's not so important. We need to get the uh, uh, intensity is a function of Q and energy or uh, uh, some basic uh, types of reduction, and then we'll handle it from there. But I think the whole uh, publication of uh, high impact papers and the whole community has now appreciated the need for having a deeper type of an analysis of the uh, uh, experimental data. So I think we have that um, uh, still a little bit fuzzy between the reduction 
and uh, what facilities do and what uh, the analysis is and what an outside community can do. I think it's a little better defined now than it was some 10 years ago. And I'll say that for the SANS part, that was that was in fact during dance was one of my uh, my soapboxes was was that was that split, which was a little bit different than because Brent, you were coming from the art side where you were building and you actually had to provide uh, reduction levels stuff there. Um, SANS is a, you know has been around for many many years, pretty much the same on every on you know, everywhere uh, in many respects, uh, but the reduction. So the line where where I, uh, where I came in with was okay. If we're doing reduction, it's going to have to be different for every single instrument around the world. If we're going to, you know, if you're talking about it just SNS, if this is a project strictly for SNS, which in some this is part of the things we had, right? SNS was sort of the foil in many senses. They're a big backer. Um, then you're writing the software for that, but we didn't have funds to do everything, right? So you had to figure out where you're going. But if you say you might be broader, then you have to do it for every single instrument because they're going to be different. And even in SNS, you're going to have different instruments at Hyper and, and, and at, uh, uh, at uh, Installation Source. Um, and so an Oak Ridge is going to be Hyper Installation Source. They're going to have to do different things. And the best people to do that are the ones who build the instrument because they're the ones who know the specifics of their instrument. So what I started going around saying is what I want is when you've taken all of the instrument artifacts out, and you've given me data that now looks the same, whether it came, I don't need to know whether it came from, uh, <clears throat> from CG2 or from, from uh, EQ Sands or from, from the NIST one or from D22 at ILL, it doesn't matter. I've got the data, it's all the same data at that point. Then the argument is anything beyond that is a common problem to all of us because it's, you know, we, have, we all have exactly the same problem. It doesn't matter where we collected that data. And from the user's point of view, a lot of our users will, you know, don't you don't always just get it from one one facility, right? You put in proposals everywhere, and you take whatever neutrons you get. And sometimes some of them are at different places. Uh, so you know, and they're going to be reduced differently because those instruments are different. But then you're going to what you really care about is not that you have I versus Q. What you really care about is what's the physics or the or the science that have come that, that this tells me, right? I, I really don't care about I versus Q. I mean, I want to know. Um, you know what's uh, what's happening to this to this particle under flow. Um, um, when I add change, when I add the pH, how does that affect the structures or the dynamics of things going on? Right, that's what I care about. Visualize the lipid, as you used to say, Paul. <laughs> and of course, there is, uh, or unfortunately, there is leakage backwards. For example, um, the resolution function is uh, highly instrument dependent. And so Sassio is talking about uh, making that more flexible, a kind of resolution that you put in. And there's plenty of parameters that I have, which are nuisance parameters for, for fits in reflectometry, which, um, you know, um, did you get your alignment correct in the beginning? Or is the, the offset of the, of the sample, sample offset, uh, a fittable parameter? And how do you I mean, there are some questions in the in the science community about whether you should be fitting some of these things that you can hide a hide a truck under, but um, the uh, uh, there's been a little bit more and more over time flow backwards. Like a uh, new instrument came online at um, um, NIST, the um, uh, McCandor reflectometer. And it turns out that the resolution function, a Gaussian doesn't work very well. You need to actually use a uniform resolution function. And so that's a recent addition to Revel 1D is that now we can handle a uniform, um, uh, uniform resolution. Yeah, Thanks. resolution and multiple scattering are, are both things that but to be fair, in 2004, at least in, in the sand world and with the rest of it, most people didn't even really pay attention to resolution. Some of us did. <laughs> I think that so, a, a, AI and machine learning is also driving this yeah. back again. So we we carved out this nice thing where you you give me you give me a scattering function and then I'll take it from there kind of thing. Um, but actually, what we really want to do is to be monitoring data on the fly and then extracting weak signals from large volumes of data using using things like unsupervised learning. And that's again changing the whole paradigm. So we're going to have to kind of go back to square one. 
the challenges there are the, the, the volume and the velocity of the data and the need for then really significant computational infrastructure in the form of high-speed networks and large amounts of storage. And it, that doesn't work on some user's PC, whether they're on an airplane or, or <laughs> connected to the internet in a cafe, just as we are right now, yeah. So there's, there's some new kind of interesting and exciting but challenging issues that are kind of coming up now, which I think is going to, I'm certainly ready to completely revisit that whole paradigm of reduction versus analysis and like bundle it all back together again. Absolutely. Yeah. And so we're coming to the, the end of our hour here. So I'm going to leave us with one final question for you guys. For, I'd like each of you to answer. If you had to go back and decide whether you were to do this, pro the dance project all over again, would you do it? Oh, absolutely. Or would you run screaming? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no question. Yeah. Do it while screaming. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would do it again without a doubt. I do want to say, though, one thing in way of humility uh, that, you know, maybe it was early as far as a, a scientific community and a software development project, but this was coming anyway. Is, it was going to be a giant parade at some point. And just because we were there at, at, at early doesn't mean we were leading the parade. Okay, uh, that's what I'm just going to. I think, uh, yeah, that's true. I would, I would definitely do it again. It, yeah. was, it had a huge influence on on me and my science, as well as being a lot of fun and incredibly intellectually re rewarding. I think definitely, though, if you asked me in 2012, I might have questioned myself, but far <laughs> 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 enough hindsight, yes. <laughs> well, but but we're, deriving, we're depriving the students of the ability to learn the theory, deep theory, by having to write the software to do their analysis. So we shouldn't be giving them these canned tools because they don't learn anything, right? You just think how many grad students could have been oh, tortured. Dear. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so on that, on that lovely note, I'd like to thank, thank you, Brent, Simon, Paul, and Paul. It's been a pleasure to spend the past hour chatting with you about your experiences. And I think I could speak on behalf of the entire community when I thank you not only for your time today, but your contributions you've made to advancing the, the neutron scattering community as a whole. And so that's all the time we have for today. If you enjoyed what you saw today and have thoughts or ideas on topics or speakers for the next NSSA Neutron Cafe, DM us on Facebook or uh, through our Facebook page or tweet at us through Neutrons America. So with that said, stay safe, everyone, and have a great afternoon or evening. Thank you very much. I thought we didn't have Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> we do. We totally do. <laughs> and thank you, Claire, for organizing this. It's yeah, really great. Thanks, yes, thanks, guys. Cheers.